over on the table if I get it working. Ooh, oh, this is going to get a stupid message. I don't know what's causing that. Anyway, okay, and up with the slideshow. So where I finished last um, yesterday was showing you that but what, what I showed you was a very, very preliminary model. It's the very, very first model you can build of a, from a macro perspective, top down, working from definitions and then getting a dynamic non-equilibrium model. This is, I think I showed you a bit of that yesterday, pushing it a bit further and getting a, uh, a model which has price dynamics in it, which makes the wage distribution and wage share dynamics less extreme mm -hmm. than in the initial model and then this sure. keeps on happening. I don't know what the hell's causing that. Uh, it's the third or fourth time I've seen it this morning. I hope it doesn't keep on coming back. Um, Sir, can you say the one word, uh, some of concepts? Cross Pardon? Cross dynamics, or what was this word? Hmm? Complex, Complex dynamics. dynamics. Complex dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I mean, there's, there's another session on complex dynamics here, and the basic story about complex systems, and this is what uh, old economists didn't understand properly and needed a lot of the so-called modern neoclassical economists. A complex system doesn't mean complicated. What it means is interactions between various variables in the system in non-linear ways. And what that will give you is even with the very simple definitions for behaviour, you still get very complex cycles coming out of it. And the best illustration of that, I was just talking, this is a bit more of a bit, Back to, back to Minsky for a second, what I've got on the slides here. Um, Minsky itself is only scratching the surface of what I wanted to be able to do. So I, I've shown you a simple scalar, like a single um, scalar variable model. GDP is just a number. I'd rather have GDP broken down into multiple sectors. You can model a single economy. I'd rather be able to model multiple economies. All those things are feasible, uh, but it takes development funds to get those done. So it's still at a very infantile level compared to what I wanted to be able to do in general. But in the, the basic idea about complex systems is that there are, they are interactions of mul multiple variables in nonlinear and non-equilibrium ways. And they're quite commonplace through science in general these days. Economics has resisted it because of this obsession with equilibrium, which if, you, if you've got a system in equilibrium, it's not a complex system, okay? Pretty much end of story. Uh, and therefore, the economy is not a complex system. We can model it using equilibrium tools. Well, tough shit, it is. So I've got to use non-equilibrium tools. And there's and a whole... So you get complexity mainly by specifying the relationship as being non-linear? Yeah, that's yes. fundamental. If that's fundamental. fundamental. If you have linear... As long you as you, are, you stick your... You, uh, you lock yourself into a linear world... You can't see it. You get much... You can't see it, thing yeah. Going on. Because if you have a linear system... If you have something of input which is 10 times the size of another simulation, the effect will be 10 times the scale. Everything's, that's the definition of a linear system. But if you have something which is non-linear, uh, then something which is 10 times the input can have a thousand times the impact. And also, when you have a linear, we have a linear system, what happens close to equilibrium is exactly the same as what will happen an enormous distance from equilibrium. So you have a linear system, and it's a, a tractor from one inch from the equilibrium, it'll be an attractor a million miles from the equilibrium as well. And if it's a repeller, the same story will happen. If it's, if it's repulsive one inch from equilibrium, it'll be repulsive a million miles from equilibrium as well. With a nonlinear system, it can be attractive far from the equilibrium and repulsive close to the equilibrium. So therefore we can get a system which has sustained cycles, doesn't give you breakdown. And the best illustration of that, I think I've got it on this particular model here, um, is the model that came from Lorenz in terms of the weather. Because it, what Lorenz was trying to explain was the importance of nonlinearity meteor to meteorologists back in the 1960s. Because back at that stage, they used a range of tools, but they also used linear statistical methods to try to forecast the weather. And Lorenz was convinced the most important dynamics in the weather system were nonlinear. And the basic, one of my colleagues in this area says, the whole idea of nonlinear is a bit like saying um, non-mammal mammals, okay? Every, rather, rather non-elephant non, non mammals. There's only a tiny fraction of systems that are actually linear. The vast majority are non-linear. Okay? And that's simply because things interact. Like, for example, this table is non-linear. Reason being, if it was linear, it'd be touching Uranus, uh, uh, maybe it'd be touching Jupiter, <laughs> okay? It stops, therefore it's non-linear. Okay? Even, even a simple thing like a table, which is flat, 
which you think is linear, is nonlinear because it ends. Okay, so everything is nonlinear. The abstraction of trying to make things, squeeze things into a linear box, only works if a very special set of conditions apply. And those conditions are often applied by setting constraints to the system so it doesn't get into the nonlinear range. So if you look at how engineers design things like, for example, shock absorbers on cars, they're making sure that they're strongly damped systems so they return to the equilibrium. But they've built systems to make sure they do that. Otherwise, every time you went over a bump, your car would bounce you know, incessantly. So there's all sorts of damping built into those systems to keep it within the, within the linear range. That's not the economy. Now, the, the first time this was demonstrated was with Lorenz, because, again, with all the, all the linear tools they're using to try to predict the weather, he's saying, look, the main interactions are nonlinear. But the equations that they had were structural equations, the actual nature of interacting fluids, called the Navier-Stokes equations. I think there are 11-dimensional nonlinear partial differential equations, huge system of equations, summarised by things like tensors, but still extremely complicated. And Lorenz knew that was just too, too complicated to simulate. He simply couldn't write it. What he did was a amount of mathematics to reduce it to three nonlinear differential equations, not, not ordinary, not, not partial differential equations. So there's just three variables and three constants. A, B, and C are the, are the constants. X, Y, and Z are the variables. Now, you, it's pretty hard to imagine a simpler system than that. So most people look at that and expect that to have pretty simple dynamics. And that's the dynamics it actually had. So I'll show you it running. So that's, this is the defining that system in Minsky. Again, it's very simple to define this stuff. This is saying the rate of, the rate of change of x is a multiplied by y minus x. The rate of change of y is x minus b times z minus y. And the rate of change of z is x times y minus c times z. If you take a look at the, uh, you do it, do it with the flowchart with the flowchart definition, but it's exactly the same as writing those equations up there. So it's an incredibly simple system. Uh, yeah. yeah. One quick question. Yeah. Uh, in Minsky, I think I'm going to try to to, yeah. to play with Minsky. Yeah. That's why the question. Um, so you can write the equations, or you can use. The Unfortunately, no. At the moment, you can only use the flowchart to define the equations. I want to make it possible to write the equations as well and go in both directions. Uh -huh. That's just more computer coding. That's why I want to raise more money to develop the software further. Yeah. Because See, to me it would be so much easier to just write the equations. I know, I know, but unfortunately you've got to use the flowchart. I mean, that's, that was the paradigm. System Dynamics established that flowchart paradigm 50 years ago. Who went to the talk with the guy from the Limits to Growth last night? Yes. Okay. Well, the Limits to Growth sponsored the very first construction of a model like this, which was became the, the, the Limits to Growth. Have, you, have any of you read Limits to Growth, by the way? Okay, another piece of reading for you. If you search for limits to growth PDF, you'll find the entire document for free on the internet. And that was the very first attempt to build a system, a systemic model of the global um, ecology, allowing for non-linearity between things like population growth, pollution production, industrial production, food production, and so on. And and I think that's one of the great works of humanity, that particular piece of work. That's where these software packages first came from. Okay. And that, the, the way they did it was to show a flowchart to show the relationships between variables. So that's been the overall paradigm. Uh, I've used a range of mathematics programs that let me write equations directly as well. And I want to combine the two. But you can't do that on $250,000 total funding. You know, I've got to get more funding. So that's what I'm trying to, trying to do. Uh, but so, nonetheless, if you, if you, if you, or you, it's actually, Minsky is easier. I'll just quickly bring up another instance of Minsky to show this. It's, it's got a lot of advantages over the existing programs because I've stolen some ideas from other software packages. So you, you don't have to go up here and click, like you, you can go up here and click and put in a plus sign down here and then say you want to have a variable which might be A and give it a value of 1 uh, and then click and place that somewhere the, on the a canvas and then go up and click another variable and call that B and give it a value of 2 and put that somewhere in the canvas. That's what you've got to do all the other programs. Then what you do is you wire it together and uh, you define your operation. But you can also with Minsky directly type onto the, onto the um, surface. It is type C and press enter. You've created a variable there. You don't need to go up to the, to the menu to do it. And none of the other programs support um, 
Greek characters, for example. So if you type alpha, you've got to type the text string alpha, and what you get is the word alpha on screen. But if you type backslash A-L-P-H-A in Minsky, you get the Greek character alpha. Make that larger, OK? Um, and then all the mathematical operations, if you want to have a multiplied by key, you just type the multiplied by key. So it's, it's faster than working with, with the other programs, but it still means you've got to use the flowchart approach rather than the... Um, rather than um, writing the equations directly. Does anyway, that, that yeah? C now has the value of A plus um, X? What yeah. Was, um, Over here. Can we, A plus B. Yeah. A plus B. Yeah, it'll, it'll graph it. I mean, if I, if I put a graph there... And through the graphic, we can see the values. Yeah. Unfortunately, at the moment, all you can do is graph the values. You can't... Uh, I'll actually... Let's just make this a bit more complicated, just to muck around a bit. So if I... Um, this, this, is a, this is a stupid set of equations. But, whoops, hang on. But Minsky let me define it. And uh, they've only got the one outcome. But if you simulate that for all time, uh, those equations generate those values. Okay. Now, what I want to do is that as well is add a display. If you right-click, you can see what the value is at the moment of that, that variable. It's currently coming out as zero, because I've probably got one of these coming in as zero. Um, but, but what I want to have is a little text display showing that that takes programming time. Okay. So other programs in the field like VinSim, well, there's a whole lot of other programs I've mentioned, VinSim, VizSim, uh, they've had much more development money put into them. They don't support the gobbly table. That's the thing, that this unique thing about Minsky is gobbly tables for doing financial flows. Uh, but I also think um, as an interface, I think Minsky's got a superior interface because those programs developed their interfaces 30 years ago and they haven't really updated them and they don't enable you to type directly onto the canvas as a whole lot of limitations. Um, so I prefer Minsky, um, but it's still pretty underdeveloped. Okay. But to Is show, there a basic yeah, tutorial? Yeah. Pardon? Basic There's tutorial. a basic, if you go, unfortunately not all that well developed. Again, that takes time. Pre press the F1 key. And he says press the F1 key. I've got a bug on that one. I won't bother with that. Throw F1 here. Okay. And you get a text, you know, a very basic text file telling you um, what assistant dynamics about. Click on the help there. Um, it's, 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 again, this is all stuff I'd like to update, but it takes time and money to get that done. Um, um, compares it to different programs, shows you what operators are, uh, explains how the switch works, talks about variable names, initial conditions, uh, what wiring is. We have grouping, but not very well done still. Um, how godly tables function, so it's, oh, it's, it's reasonable, it's not nothing, nothing as complete as I'd like it to be, but at least it's there, okay? And there's a PDF document as well that comes with the program, so that'll, that'll give you a starting point, okay? But the basic uh, story about these programs is, is, is getting complex behaviour from what look like very simple systems, so I'll just, again, make it a bit bigger, and drag it over a bit so you can see it in the centre, and this was again Lorenz trying to make the make the point about the importance of nonlinear dynamics. Now, what this oh, where the fuck is that coming from? Pardon my French. Um, um, the um, <laughs> that'll go on YouTube, won't it? Okay. Uh, great to do that in a religious institution as well. Um, okay. But. What, what this actually is a simulation of, this, this model effectively is, a, is what's called a Bernoulli, I think it's called a Bernoulli um, cell. If you put a pot on a stove and you put it at a medium temperature, then what you'll find ultimately these cells start forming where the water's circulating, they're coming up and going around like so. Have you ever noticed that in soup? Little bubbles which turn up in the same pattern. This is pretty much a model of that. So what you've got is an XY location on a hot plate and then the temperature gradient between the top and the bottom, effectively, of the, the layer of fluid. That's simulating this behaviour. And you, it works out having three equilibria. Okay? They're all unstable. So the equilibria, rather than telling you where the system will be and what's going to happen, tell you where the system will not be and what it's going to be repelled from. And they're called strange attractors. Let's watch the behaviour of that system here.
If you heard the expression about a butterfly's wings flapping and causing a cyc- in, in, in Brazil and flapping and causing a cyclone in China, that's where the idea comes from. It looks like the wings of a butterfly. The, the three-dimensional plot's even more beautiful than that because it is a three-dimensional system. That's, like a, that's a two-dimensional projection of the system. But there's one of your equilibria. There's another. And the third is down here at zero, zero. They're all repellers. And, and two, one, one is, a, is a repeller, which is a, a, a real repeller. So it has two attracting vectors and one repelling vector, all real. And the other two have got uh, two, one attracting real vector and two repelling complex vector uh, eigenvalues. And that's why you get this amazingly complicated pattern coming out of it. And that will go on forever. It's never going to stabilise, it'll never reach equilibrium, but it's a genuine model. So the whole obsession economists have about the modelling in equilibrium shows a lack of awareness of complex systems. And if they try, what they try to, when they try to meld this stuff with their own information, you can't put this on top of, a, of, a, of an equilibrium system. It just doesn't, that's not how it works. You've got to be working in non-equilibrium. So that's, that's the uh, major insight from complex systems. And, uh, I hope there's a, going to be some information taken from um, the other complex systems course here so you can see that as well. But that's, that's why I think we've got to work in complex systems in general. The economy is a complex system. It's simply futile to try to model it as an equilibrium system. Except if you're in the vicinity of the equilibrium and who knows what that is in the economy anyway. Okay? okay. So leave the clunky stuff to the neoclassicals there's a, I've got a couple of good links here, particularly the second one, chaosbook.org. That's a, that's a free and about a thousand page book on complex systems. It's absolutely comprehensive resource. You probably won't go to read most of it, but a lot, the part you can read will be extremely useful. And it's, as I said, it's free and they're continuously updating it. So what I want to do as well is integrate this with the... Um, the integrate this complex systems approach with the work in economics, which is also not obsessed with equilibrium. So people like Marx, Keynes, Schumpeter, Shackle, Minsky, Goodwin, Blatt, I've got Korn out here on, this, on the page as well. They're all people who worked without constraining themselves to thinking in an equilibrium way. And they're the ones that I see as a real foundation for a decent modern economics. And of course you've got to integrate it with the ecology as well, which we, no school of economics has done that, including ecological economics yet because we still haven't got to the stage of having a valid model of production that includes energy and therefore includes the role of the, the link between the, the economy which exploits energy and the ecology into which we dump waste energy, which is pretty much the situation we're in. Um, so all these things, the fact that the real world is far from equilibrium, it's dynamic, not equilibrium, they're all beyond the type of analysis which economics got started in, and because that, econ- that analysis didn't even quite work on its own terms, I think economists have been obsessed with trying to make it work. Well, they can't. Give up. Okay? On its own terms, it doesn't work. For example, this is what uh, one, of, one of the classical instances there came from Poincaré, who's a, a brilliant mathematician, one of, one of the, the, not just of his time, but of all time, one of the truly great mathematicians. Poincaré... Uh, solve what's called the three-body problem, which was Newton's equations of gravitation that explained uh, the dynamics of the relationship between a single uh, sun and a single planet. And that will have an elliptical orbit around the sun because if you throw the... If the planet is sort of hurled around the, the star, then it's going to be... Only if it's hurled precisely from the middle position is it going to have a circular orbit it's going to be further away and close to have an apogee and a perigee and it will then have an elliptical orbit and that's what Newton's mathematics proved and what's Copernicus's research... Oh, not Copernicus, I've um, uh, forgotten the, the one whose research established that Kepler, Kepler's research showed that the, the description of the orbit was elliptical. Um, well, nobody could solve what's... What about two planets and a sun? Okay, so that was a, a huge problem set back in the ever since Newton solved the equation for, for two bodies, what about three or more bodies? And finally, the French king issued a prize, I think, of 100,000 francs back in the 1800s. And that's a huge amount of money for anybody who could solve the three-body problem. Poincaré solved it and proved the orbits would be chaotic. 
So the very first understanding of chaos came from Poincaré back in 1899. And, uh, of course, uh, being in France, Volvoir uh, knew that Poincaré was the best mathematician of his time. And Volvoir wrote to Poincaré asking if Poincaré could validate that um, the belief that Volvoir had that his system would reach equilibrium, the atonement process, he asked Poincaré to validate that it would reach equilibrium. And Poincaré was unwilling to give him the answer. He said, no, I don't know, and I don't, I don't believe it's guaranteed in the way you think and I'm not willing to commit to give you my imprimatur. And 20 years later, by the totally incidental to that, two pure mathematicians solved the nature of a, an array of all positive, non-negative numbers. What's the nature of the dominant eigenvalue of a system of non-negative numbers in a matrix? And the answer was it's got a positive uh, dominant eigenvalue. Now, applied to um, Volrad's process, that means the equilibrium will not be reached. The equilibrium is a repeller. Therefore, you won't reach an equilibrium vector. If you start a non-equilibrium vector of prices for Volrad's Tetonin system, you won't approach an equilibrium vector over time. Okay. So that should have been, oh dear, that doesn't work. Let's go, let's extend our understanding for markets. Let's now work out non-equilibrium price dynamics. No, they just jumped, they, they didn't realise the issue for 30 years. And when they did start to realise it, they tried to find ways of forcing it back to the equilibrium's conclusion. Well, give up on it. It's just wrong. Yeah. Uh, do you know where did I, uh, where did I find this uh, when you just said uh, somewhere uh, written? I mean, if I want to call it somewhere. If you go through, and it's, I think it's the third or fourth chapter in Debunking Economics, and all the references are there as well. So you can go back and check out the references that way. Okay. Neoclassicals yeah, think I don't understand it, they don't understand their own problem. But this is actually showing where Forrester came from, because Forrester. Uh, was the one who developed the technology that limits to growth used. And the way it came about was he was asked, pardon me, let's go back, he was asked by a factory to try to explain why it had cycles in its production system. And they were thinking there must be some exogenous cause of these cycles. But he looked at what's actually going on and saying, well, there's a delay between, um, what's this? This, is, this is all hand typed, as you can see, between reasons and decision. Uh, and then you have motivating event happens, delay between reasons and decision, that delay then means you've got a decision at this point, then you have a delay between the decision and the start of an advertising campaign, uh, then you have the first advertisements appearing, and then there's a delay in the sales building up, etc, etc. So it's looking at all these delays and so that's going to give you cycles. And said, so if you want to get rid of the cycles, you've got to look at the timing of all these decisions you make, and then by changing the timing, you can maybe eliminate the cycles or attenuate them. So that was the very beginning of system dynamics with Forrester. But ever since then, it's been possible to do all these different approaches. But looking at what the neoclassical school has done, I think the main thing that the neoclassical schools end up doing is by accident, showing the classical school is generally on the right track, with one major exception, as I'll talk about in a moment. Because the proof that you can't uh, derive a market demand curve from adding together isolated individuals who all have uh, downward sloping market in individual demand curves proves that you've got to work at the level of social classes. This is the Sinai Shine Manchild de Brewer theorem. Again, I cover that in debunking economics. And Alan Kerman had the but the only really sensible reaction to it from within the mainstream. And that's to say that uh, looking at the results, the only way you can actually use these results sensibly is to say we've got to work uh, at the level of groups who have collectively coherent behaviour. That's called social classes. Workers, capitalist bankers, poor people, wealthy people, etc, etc. Once you aggregate that way, then you can start working out demand and expenditure functions. He's saying the idea we've got to start working at the level of the isolated individual is one which we may well have to abandon. So that's a sensible reaction to those to the, to the Sinochon Mandel de Burr theorem. That wasn't what the majority of neoclassical economists did. They they dreamt up the representative agent. That's where it came from. Not because it was a sensible idea. It was the only way to get over this problem. But the way you get over that problem involves not just hypothesizing agents who are all the same, so a representative agent represents all of us. Commodities had to be identical as well. Okay? There couldn't be luxuries and necessities. There could only be you know, homothetic preferences and 
constant, uh, constant sloping angles curves. That means all commodities are the same. Well, if all commodities are the same, what the hell is a price about? Okay? Yeah, I, I can work with a level of an aggregate price dynamic in my system just because I want to uh, bring in monetary dynamics. Um, but if they see relative prices as being so important, and yet the only way they can actually model the system is to have a single commodity, there's no such thing as a relative price. I'm talking monetary prices, which is a different thing. So, uh, and again, the idea of objective cost theories, because you can't aggregate subjective theory. Again, this is where Passanetti's work and Schraffer's work was so important, and I've done work on the theory of supply as well, that you, you simply can't add up the subjective uh, preference theories of the neoclassicals for demand. You can't add up the subjective um, the, the marginal, marginal cost and marginal um, product type derived supply curves either. So again, the classicals were correct in working with objective cost, cost theories where cost was seen as being relatively constant with scale. So I think that, that raises the question, where should we start? And my opinion is uh, not with Smith. Because I think Smith, rather than being the person who built the foundations of economics, I think he misled us unintentionally, which is what we're most times economists mislead, it's by, by accident rather than deliberately. But he was preceded by the only school of thought that ever got economics right in terms of how it relates to the physical world, and that's the physiocrats. Because when you look at the physiocrats' work, it's the only theory of production that is correct according to the laws of thermodynamics, which were discovered a century after the physiocrats wrote. Now, how many of you know what the laws of thermodynamics are? Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's about it. I find normally with a, one person who's got a rough idea, which is good. Uh, but this is a beautiful statement by a, 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 a very a good popularizer of physics back in the 1920s. And he's saying, if somebody points out that your pet theory of the universe disagrees with Maxwell's equations, well, so much the worse for Maxwell. Okay. That was pretty much the situation of Max Planck. Uh, if it's found to be contradicted by observations, well, the experimental people do make mistakes sometimes. Okay. But if your theory contradicts the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for you to do but to collapse in deepest humiliation. In other words, that is a law which simply cannot be broken. But if you look at it, the economic theory of production breaks that law all the time. Not one of them, bar the physiocrats, has been correct. This is Arthur Eddington back in the 1920s. So the reason for this is that the universe obeys these laws. They, they were discovered empirically and then codified in the, in the late 19th century by a range of, of uh, physicists, Boltzmann, Gibbs, and people like that. And the first law is energy is conserved. You can neither create nor destroy it. Now, we've generalised that. We now define matter as a form of energy as well. But using E equals mc squared, the same conservation law applies. Overall, you do not destroy... Uh, you don't destroy it or create it. You change its form. That's the first law. The second law is that Effectively, it's, it's always something you have to paraphrase, and it's the hardest one to get your head around. I always get the terms you know, high and low entropy wrong myself. Uh, disorder, effectively, the best way to understand it is to say disorder increases over time. So you go from highly refined energy to less refined energy over time, which is actually defined as low, as, as low to high in terms of entropy. And the third law, effectively, you can just paraphrase it as waste, and that is that 100% conversion of energy into work requires some of you can dump waste, uh, waste is absolute zero, and there's no place in the universe at absolute zero. Okay. The background temperature of the universe is about three degrees above absolute zero. So there's no place in the, in the universe where you can dump your heat into a hole which is absolute zero so you can use all the available energy. And I'll take you through the logic behind that. So if you have any closed system, system which does not have energy coming in from the outside, it will degrade over time. And that, but when you look at what production and economic growth are about, that's increasing order over time. Um, if we have more outputs than inputs, and we expect that every year, we're worried when it doesn't happen, and the outputs themselves are more in more order than the inputs. We take iron ore and coal, we turn them into steel. Yeah. No, they imply every, every damn instant of every minute. Um, yeah. I don't know. You cannot violate them for even a millisecond. Yeah, yeah. 
okay? It's, you, 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 what, what, it, you know, what, what it implies is that if, if you're going to violate the laws in, in, in a localised region, you've got, if, like, by having production increasing order, there has to be an increase in disorder in the total. Okay? So you can't have production which simply increases order and doesn't cause more disorder elsewhere. So the aggregate effect of a production process must be increased to be increased disorder. And that means if you add up all the pollution, all the waste that's generated, it must be more disorder out of the aggregate of what's produced out of a production system than what went into it. Okay, so you take a certain amount of stuff and you create a new amount of stuff and the new amount of stuff is more disordered than the stuff you started with. Now what we're doing is we're hanging on to the stuff which is more ordered and throwing away the less ordered stuff. We call that pollution. Okay? Which is one reason why I don't believe you can use a price system to solve the whole problem. Because if you priced everything, it would be, be negative prices. Yeah. Yeah. That's true in the level of, of the, well, yes, that's true. But uh, for our purposes, when we are building economic theory, we can, for example, say that we have energy coming from the sun mm -hmm. to our, our economic system. Yep. And that's, uh, that's an instance of... Um, that's an open system. That's the difference. It's not a closed system. Once you say it's open and we're getting energy coming in from the outside for free, then we can reduce disorder within the planet. Yeah. Okay? That's, that's the, um, our planet is an open system. Yep. And there's coming um, this uh, energy to our planet uh, and within, say, one, one thousand or, or several thousands of years, we can assume that this Continue. Yep. Mm -hmm. so we, are, we are like practically when it comes to the time, uh, time um, perspective, a bit like different level of theory. Yeah, theory. yeah, but that's an open system. So this, that's one distinction I'm making. That's why I said it's a closed system. Any or any closed system degrades over time. So if you have a model of a closed system, it cannot give you increased order. So the only reason you can get increased order out of production is because we're an open system. And therefore you have to acknowledge that in your model of production. If you don't acknowledge it, if you have a model of production that doesn't acknowledge we're an open system, then you haven't got an accurate model of production. Okay? okay? And um, so there has to be this external source, which is what you're talking about. It has to be an open system which can drive a local decrease in entropy. Okay? And while causing a global increase, it's still got to be consistent with the second law. So whatever we're doing in the aggregate has to cause an increase in disorder, but within the sphere we're working in, a decrease in disorder can occur. You think about, look, look at the beautiful planet we're on, what's, what we've left of it, okay? That beauty was created by exploiting the open, the, by, by biological life, exploiting the open system of the planet and created a more ordered environment locally, but it was based in, on the energy coming in from the sun for free enabling that order to be created locally. But the actual use of energy by plants was more use of energy, more, con more conversion of energy from uh, a um, highly ordered form to a less ordered form than if there was no life. Okay? If you look at the moon, the moon's also receiving that sunlight. Okay? It's also reflecting some of that sunlight. There's no increase in order out of that on the moon. There is an increase of that on Earth. And Earth, therefore, is effectively doing more conversion of high energy input of the sun to low energy radiation of, of you know, infrared and so on than the, than the moon is. So there's arguments about life itself being an entropy increasing process, even though when we see the impact locally, it's an increase in order rather than a decrease in order. And what we are is, is running a production system is an extension of that we can accelerate that process. We do more to convert disorder into water by exploiting free energy and creating more entropy in the process than any other species on the planet. So when you look at it this way, the circular flow diagram, which 
as ubiquitous in economics, is inconsistent with the second law because it implies you can create more output uh, in a closed system. Because if you see how they, they, they show them things like this, I think this is from, uh, from MAMQ. So you've got product markets, you've got households, you've got factories, you've got firms, you know, goods going one way, money going the other, which even they doesn't include money in his bloody models. Uh, here's another one. And again, it's factor payments, income, consumption, expenditure, sales receipts, loans internally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All that stuff is a closed system. Um, there's no non-economic input to that. Everything's produced within the system. Uh, so that simply is not possible. You've got to have uh, something coming in from the outside. We have to be mining energy, in effect. The only way we can actually do any of this is taking advantage of stuff we can't produce. We cannot make energy, that's the first law. Okay? So we've got to be mining it, finding it and just making use of it. And this, this implies that a closed system could produce increasing output over time, which it can't. Uh, and the production without waste is possible as well. There's no acknowledgement of waste in that system, and that's impossible, according to the second law okay? and the third law. So you can only be working if we're exploiting available energy, which we can't produce. Um, that's the first law. We can only exploit energy that currently exists, and that concludes converting matter to energy. And we're, when we're exploiting it, we necessarily generate waste because we change the form of energy. We, uh, we go from high quality energy, things like solar energy or a lump of coal, to low quality energy plus work. Okay. So you take in a high level of heat, you end up with a low level of heat, we take in solar radiation, you end up with infrared, etc., etc. You do work in the meantime, um, but you've got this low quality energy you've generated necessarily as part of the production process, and those are the, the second and third laws. So the minimum modification you need to make that circular row flow diagram work is first of all saying there are energy inputs that are non -ma not man-made coming in from the environment and that there's waste injected back into the environment. So something like this makes sense. You've got the sun pumping in energy from the outside, the biosphere absorbing that energy as, as well as production. Uh, pardon me, press that button too fast, let's see. and then waste and useful work being created back into the biosphere, enabling that system to turn. So it's not a circular flow, nor is it what some uh, ecological economists are calling the circular economy. Uh, it's, it's actually it's a misleading term, because a circle, I think it, the better term is the wheel. Okay, Wheel circular, okay. But the only way we will, and it's also the first great machine we ever invented. We had tools before that, but if you think about what was our first real machine, um, maybe a lever was the first machine, okay? but maybe you can regard a lever as a tool as well, but a machine that actually really dramatically enhances um, energy input, dramatically reducing the friction involved in moving an object from one point to another, that was our first real machine. And it's still fundamental today. We don't use flint knives anymore, we still use wheels. So I think what I call the wheel economy. And a wheel only turns because you're pushing it using available energy. So my expression is to say the wheel economy. And Kate Raworth, is a mate of mine in the UK, has written a very, very good book called Donut Economics. I'd rather say let's make the donut into a wheel. Again, the same basic idea. The wheel has a rim. Okay. But the wheel is a more accurate model, again, than Kate's idea of a donut economy. So we, why can't we produce without using existing energy and produce without creating waste. This is where the laws of thermodynamics come in. As I said, they're empirically observed in the first instance and finally codified in the 19th century. And uh, this is long after the physiocrats wrote, which is quite curious. They, even though they didn't have the existence of the wisdom of physics, they managed to perceive what physics later confirmed uh, out of their own observations of rural, uh, very predominantly rural France. So. There are complicated mathematical rules to understand it. I don't understand those rules fully myself. Um, I need to spend a fair bit of time learning the mathematics to do it properly. But I think you all know the Big Bang and Sheldon Cooper. Okay. Well, this this is I think it was um, this uh, Jack Kerouac. I think was the one who came up with this particular joke. An American 
um, sort of gonzo humorist. And he says, the laws of thermodynamics are the following. You can't win. Okay? You can't break even. And you can't leave the game. Those, what do they actually mean? Well, slightly more informatively, you can only break even. Because you, know, you can't create or destroy energy. You can simply change its form. You can only break even if you can dump your waste heat into a place which has, is absolute, at absolute zero and there's no such place. Okay? If you don't like the rules, you can't leave either because you're in the universe. The only way to leave is to die and even then your corpse is still here and it, it'll decay according to the laws of thermodynamics. So we're stuck with it. Um, so energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can only change its form. The maximum amount of energy you can do depends upon the background temperature where you're doing that work because you've got to dump waste heat out to actually do work and I'll show you that in a moment. So only if the background temperature is at absolute zero can you turn all the energy you're using into work and there's no place in the universe at that temperature level. So um, it, this, this is not the complete explanation but if you imagine having a water wheel and you're trying to turn that water wheel you've got to have a gap between where the water comes in and where it ends up. If there's no gap the wheel won't turn. Okay. That's the essential starting point. So there's your potential energy and there's your work. So you can't generate that work unless there's a gap between the two. And the same thing applies in general. You can only, the maximum amount of energy you can actually use to do work depends between the gap between where the energy is exploited and where the work is, where the work is actually done. Now the second law of thermodynamics, you've got to exchange heat with an external system. If you don't do that, then you can't extract any energy at all because a closed system will degrade to a uniform temperature over time. If you have a boiler which doesn't dump waste into the external world, the temperature in the entire boiler will gradually head towards the same uniform level. Um, and power generation works because we dump waste heat back into the environment. So you have a boiler over here, that's what we all see, but you've, you've all seen cooling towers. Okay? If the cooling tower wasn't attached to the boiler, this wouldn't turn. So you've got to be dumping that waste energy back into the universe again, which is one reason why there's an essential link between economics and ecology that economics has spent a lot of its time denying, but when you look at it properly, it simply has to include it. So this generates power only because this dumps waste heat back into the environment. So there's a necessary link between economics and ecology, which we're not aware of because we haven't built a version of production that actually includes the need to use external energy to produce work. So if you isolate that from the environment, you wouldn't get any work done. And the reason is you have a boiler here with a turbine there, uh, and you're applying flames to the boiler, uh, the temperature would be the same either side of the turbine. So the turbine just wouldn't spin. The only way you can actually make it spin is to dump the waste heat outside the system so that it's hotter on one side of the turbine than on the other and therefore the heat, the hot air will cause the turbine to spin or the hot water will cause the turbine to spin. So, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, man-made global warming yeah. uh, does not uh, to be proven uh, in any other way but to, to, have, to make reference to these laws of thermodynamic? More, it, it, global warming is more than that again. A global warming includes the effect of, 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 of uh, molecules that trap heat, meaning it doesn't get reflected back into outer space again. So if you look at what happens on, on Mars, there's no atmosphere on Mars. There used to be an atmosphere. It's been removed by the solar wind, we believe, or so physicists believe. But the atmosphere contains carbon dioxide and water vapour. And when you have, if you have a, if you have, imagine a, a light ray bouncing off, you know, hitting Antarctica and going back into the atmosphere again, then that light ray, you know, white light, hits a carbon dioxide molecule. It then pushes the, um, the electrons of the carbon dioxide molecule from one uh, valence level to a higher, higher level. And when it falls back down, the photon that's emitted by, the carb by that carbon dioxide molecule will have a lower energy, be an infrared rather than, ultra, rather than ultraviolet or light. And that infrared, of course, gets projected you know, out into space as well, but back down to the planet again. So we're capturing a large amount of the heat. And if it wasn't for water vapour and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature of the planet would be about minus 20 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. okay? So global warming was necessary for life to exist anyway. 
what we've done is we've added from we've gone from 280 parts per million in the pre-industrial period, the recent pre-industrial lasting 100,000, 200,000 years, 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. And what happens is there's a logarithmic increase in the amount of absorption that occurs because of that. Uh, but if you have a logarithmic increase in the absorption per molecule and an exponential increase in the molecules, you get a linear increase in temperature. And most of that, again, is because of feedback effects. So I think something of the order, looking at the scale of warming people are worried about, and this is, this is the genuine maximums people are talking about, uh, there's some, some scientists believe there's going to be, given the amount of carbon dioxide we've added to the planet, we're going to get about a six degree increase in temperature. Forget two, okay? Now, of that, about 10% is due to carbon dioxide capture. Most of that is other feedback systems that exist as well. So if you look at uh, that rise in temperature is efficient to reduce the amount of ice in Antarctica and the Arctic, and that means there's less light reflection going up, which means the temperature rises even more. Uh, and then if you have enough of an in temperature increase, then all the carbon, di carbon dioxide which is stored in the tundra gets released, and that's 10 times as much apparently, carbon dioxide as we have on the planet right now, so that adds, etc., etc. All these non-linear factors, again, mean that that increase in the carbon dioxide absorption ends up being multiplied by a factor of 10, roughly, to give a potential increase in temperature of 6 degrees. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're talking about 2. But, so it, but it's all these non-linear feedbacks, again. But this, this one is independent again. And the, the beautiful point, point here is that even if we didn't have global warming, in the sense of the capture of radiation. If we continue on the current rate at which we're increasing energy absorption uh, or energy used in production, if we kept that rate of increase up for another 450 years, even without global warming, the temperature of the planet would be 100 degrees Celsius on average. Because of the heat we are yeah, dumping waste heat. out of... Yeah, waste heat. And if we kept on going for another 2,000 years, the temperature would be the same as the sun. Okay, so you know we, we've got to do something about this at some stage. Okay, it, is, it isn't an optional extra, but what we're ignoring is this in this whole factor of, of entropy. Um, the reason that you that this that piston can do work right now, but if you let the piston go loose, then what's going to happen is the atoms are going to bounce around and push it. I push it too far, of course, because. I haven't got three on the other side still. But you're going to go to, from the very ordered situation that's there to a disordered situation over time, unless you continue providing pressure to keep the piston back on the other side. That's the basic logic. So high entropy is fairly uniform pressure. Low entropy is, is very ordered. So the, the low entropy situation for all the atmosphere inside this room would be to whack it all up in one of the light bulbs up there. You know, that's, That'd be low entropy. High entropy is that we can all breathe it over here. So pine isn't necessarily a bad thing, but that's that process of being very ordered to disordered, that's what tends to happen without an external energy system coming in. So that's, that's a universal tendency which economics hasn't actually properly incorporated. So you can't get rid of waste. Okay, the whole idea of a, of a costless, wasteless system is just wrong, but economics is obsessed with that, the idea of perfect efficiency. If we actually understood efficiency, we wouldn't talk about perfection. Uh, and that gives you the link between economics and ecology. And there's no school that does it properly, even in environmental economics yet, because it hasn't actually properly incorporated energy so far and looks at how production using free energy effectively goes in the opposite direction. We start with ordered stuff, disordered stuff, we end up with ordered stuff at the other side. So production must increase disorder in the aggregate. That's where the entropy dumping comes in. Um, so we've got some big questions to answer there. How can we produce a surplus? How do we produce more outputs in every year? Input, outputs and inputs every year. Um, and can we use market mechanisms to control this? You know, I just don't think we can. Can we grow forever on a finite planet, etc., etc.? Now this is the important one I want to talk about today because the only school that has actually answered this properly is the physiocrats. How do we actually do that? When you understand these laws of energy, we can't be producing more order than more order than out of disorder unless we're mining external energy. Okay? So in that some sense, we're not producing a surplus. We're mining and hanging on to some of what's there already. 
and turning into the useful stuff for ourselves. But we're miners. We are fundamentally miners. So you can't get a surplus in an isolated system. It must degrade over time. So production is only possible because the Earth is an open system, receiving incoming energy and having stored solar energy and nuclear energy inside it. And farms and factories exploit that to produce more output. That's what we're actually doing. So we need a model of production that fits that. Um, but necessarily also causes more disorder. So we tie ourselves up with the theory of ecology as well. Um, so the, the disorder of the outputs, including all the waste, is greater than the order of the inputs. And there's only one school of thought that's ever been close to that, and that's the physiocrats. Who's heard of the physiocrats before? So who's read anything by a physiocrat? We didn't, I didn't read Kenny. Pardon? I didn't read him. Okay, Re Cantillon's the best starting point, Richard Cantillon. And he has a beautiful opening statement, which I think I've got in included in these slides. Canet's the most famous because he was the one who actually, combining with his knowledge, knowledge of, uh, of circulation, which was just becoming part of medical science at the time, he saw a, a way in which the, the circulation inside the economy appeared to him to be like the circulation of blood inside the body, and that's what the idea of physiocrats, because he was the, he was the physiologist for the, uh, for the French king, and this was the circulation of money and goods from one organ to another, and similar to circular flow diagrams today, but effectively arguing that production is only possible because we're mining energy, but believing that was only done by agriculture. And when you think about it, in some ways a limited perspective is what gave them their advantage, because being in... 19th century, 18th century France, which is overwhelmingly an agricultural nation. It's obvious when you plant one corn seed, you get a corn plant. The inputs and the outputs are the same. Okay. So you know there's something magical going on there. Whereas in manufacturing, the inputs might be coal the, and, 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 and iron ore. The outputs are iron. They're very, very different things. And so the difference in terms of exploiting energy, which is also happening in manufacturing, wasn't as visible as it is in agriculture. So here is um, some quotes, I think this is from um, Turgo. The farmer is the only one whose industry produces more than, more than the wages of his labour. He therefore is the source of all wealth. The soil, independent of any other man, pays him immediately the price of his toil. Nature grants what she grants is a physical consequence of the fertility of the soil. Now, it's all talking about agriculture. That's all they, they knew in that sense. Uh, they didn't know the laws of thermodynamics, but they're correct at that point. So they said you simply can't develop output without this free gift of nature. And that's, when you look back and see when energy, uh, they couldn't use the word energy because the word energy hadn't been invented at the time. Okay. So they, this is when you look, when you look back and find when the energy was first used, it was 30 years or so after the physiocrats ceased being uh, influential. And they argued that there was a, a net surplus because humans exploit the free gift of nature, which comes out of agriculture. This is Cantillon. And this is, this is the opening, opening sentence of his book. Land is the source of matter from which all wealth is drawn. Man's labour provides the form for its production, and wealth itself is no more than food, conveniences, and pleasures of life. And you find a very similar phrase in Smith. He stole the phrase, but he lost the dependence upon land and therefore lost the dependence upon energy. Land added by human labour produces 4, 10, 20, 150 times the amount sown. And that's the whole physical productivity that we see um, in, in agriculture, which you can't see in other industries. The farmer produces more output because of the superfluity that nature records him as a pure gift. Mm. Okay, so it's much, much wiser in that sense than anything that's come afterwards. Um, so they're correct to say that land is the source of it all, um, and they then also saw land, that was how they measured value. Rather than saying a quantity of labour, which is what Smith gave us, he's saying it's a quantity of land. The intrinsic value of anything may be measured by the quantity of land used in its production, or the quantity of labour, which enters also can be reduced to the quantity of land allocated to the labourers. So it's a land-based, which is effectively in that sense an energy-based model of production, before we even had the concept of energy. If you examine any, any means by which any inhabitant is supported, one always finds their income comes from the owner's land. Okay. Now that's wiser than anything we've done since. That's why I think Smith derailed economics by saying, no, it's not land, it's labour. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, but uh, Smith had a different objective. What he wanted to show is that it's not gold that is riches. You know, that's true. Uh, that's so true. He had a different question. But he, but he, that was a remarkable, I think, progress to understand that gold is not riches, but that it is all income. You know, he wanted to say, well, it's not what you have; it's not property that's important, but it's. But but, but also, also but Smith also met Turgo and Canet and was influenced by them, but he lost this particular yeah, idea. So I can take the point of Mercant, who's fighting mercantilism as well, but he lost two things for the sake of gaining one. I think the thing he lost was more important than the point about gold, in my opinion. So you get the physical, this idea of the physical surplus in agriculture generates all wealth. That's the vision they had. And then, that's again the quote, same quote from, uh, from Turgo, or Cantillon, pardon me, and they saw social classes as competing over the shares of the surplus being generated. So the farmers hang on to two thirds, one for their own expenses and maintenance of their labourers, the other for their own profit, uh, and then one, uh, uh, and then the remaining two thirds um, ends up going to all the other artisans, everybody else that's living on the surplus being generated in agriculture. So the essential question they're asking is, where does the surplus come from? which has been forgotten in neoclassical economics completely. It was still part of the classical school. Um, and then they're saying, what's the source of that? And they're really relating it back to the role of energy. And they divided society into three classes. Productive class that creates because of the free gift of nature. So there are your people doing your farming and they're the productive class. Um, the surplus is, you can easily see the active surplus in agriculture because if you plant one seed, then with a bit of solar radiation, you get a plant which has got hundreds of seeds. Okay. And the more productive you are in doing it, the greater the amount of surplus. So the obvious surplus in agriculture gave them an enormous advantage in that sense over, over Smith, who was in a more industrial uh, climate at the same time and would focus on division of labour. I can see why Smith didn't see what the physiocrats saw, but we lost a large amount in going from what the physiocrats saw to what... Um, uh, Smith observed. So the sterile class, industrial workers, just transformed the value they got from agriculture and the proprietors lived on the surplus because they were the owners. So they were wrong to think that agriculture was the source of the free gift, but they were right to base the argument of uh, the energy coming in from outside the system was the source of the capacity to uh, produce output in the first place. And they wrote before the Industrial Revolution, which began in Britain rather than France, but they're correct about nature being that source. So when you're harnessing open energy from an open system, you can increase the order of the subsystem, which is the economy, while you decrease the order of the ecology overall, which is what we've unfortunately managed to do very successfully. Now, when you get the classical school from both Smith and all the way to Marx, seeing labour as the source of surplus, and that's, that insight is gone, into the role of energy. And then it, when the neoclassicals ignore the very question of origin, it ignored even more so. So they, they got the locus wrong, uh, but they got the actual dynamics right. This is the reason we see uh, Canet is so important. He produced what he called the tableau economique. And that argued that every year there were 600 liras, uh, or livres, I think it was, uh, of net surplus. You, see, you start with 600, Half it goes to the, to, the, to the productive class in agriculture, half goes to the sterile class. The farmers produce equivalent surplus to what they get. They use 300, they produce a surplus of 300. The sterile, taken 300, they just change its form. It's then used as an input at the next stage down. So you saw the, the production of what, what they were producing is, is necessary for the farmers to be able to do work, but not producing a surplus in its own right. That's the division he made. So you had the sterile, you had the productive class over here, the sterile class here, and the owners down here. And that, in effect, was it was the idea of an annual product. You had uh, social classes turning up in the system, uh, agriculture producing a 100% surplus, uh, manufacturing no surplus but producing necessary outputs, and then you had the surplus accruing to the proprietors. So it's a, it's a very rich vision. And we would have been much better off starting properly with Canet rather than being sidetracked by, uh, by Smith because we have input out by dynamics turning up here. Manufacturing is needed even if it was unproductive. 
uh, there was an investment accelerator, a small increase in productivity will give you a large increase in surplus. All these sorts of notions are there. We lost it. Um, so they made the mistake of thinking it was just agriculture, and they didn't directly, as far as I've seen so far, directly say it was the sun that was the source. I've got to see if I can check the literature more thoroughly. I think I will find some statement of that nature at some point. Um, but in some ways, they were helped by the fact that they predated the Industrial Revolution because that confused things. It made it harder to see that physical surplus. Um, because industry works because we're using stored solar energy. That's what coal and oil really are. Um, so the proper next step would be to say, well, machines also harness energy, you know, and then to expand that into the production sphere. But instead, they politically lost out in France. Along comes Adam Smith, and Smith, even though he met the physiocrats, he ignored this focus upon land and chose labour as the source instead. And this is, again, take a look at how similar this is to what Cantillon wrote. The annual labour of every nation is the fund which originally supplies... So you know he's saying labour, not land. Okay? But exactly the same type of language. Um, so labour has replaced land. And then bang, that inside of the role of energy is gone. May I ask which work of Smith Pardon? was it? Which work of Smith was Which it? book? This is the book Wealth of Nations. Okay. okay. So he then says division of labour is the source of an increase, again, okay? But you can't get labour without energy. And that often I, I get involved in disputes with Marxists all the time and say, well, capital can't produce without, without labour, therefore labour is the source of value. And at least when I say, well, energy is the source of labour existing in the first bloody place, okay? So when you use this idea about precedence, ultimately you bring everything back to energy. And that's what I'll talk about. I'll talk about that in a bit of detail tomorrow, um, in the second, second course today. Now, he saw division of labour as leading to specialised machinery. So workmen not educated in this trade are not equated with the machinery. Now, he says division of labour has caused the machinery. But when you think about it, the machinery caused division of labour. You don't need to divide the labour into more specialised forms unless you produce machines that need specialised labour to operate them. So he got the causal sequence wrong. And there's a very good book, I don't know that I've linked it in here, a very good um, uh, book and, and set of papers by an economic historian asking why was it that the Industrial Revolution occurred in the UK, in England rather than in Scotland in particular, rather than in um, Europe. And the reason was labour was more expensive. Because it was more expensive, it made sense to have labour-saving inventions. What those labour-saving inventions did, first of all, was enable you to have one worker turning 15 spinning jennies rather than turning one uh, spinning wheel. But then, ultimately, to have 225 being turned by water power and 10,000 turned by steam power. And that's what gave you mechanisation. With the mechanisation of vastly increased amount of energy, can be used to produce output. And that's, again, what gave England the great advantage. So he could have seen this high cost of labour leading to pressure to innovate, new machines using energy, producing far more output than labour, and labour being, specialised labour being, being needed, therefore, to operate those m machines. But he went the other way. And the idea of a net product from labour became the focus of the classical school. How does that come about? Well, it doesn't. It only comes about because labour is exploiting the energy that it finds for free, as do the machinery. So you can't explain how labour produces more output than inputs, and you finally get Marx talking about a gap between labour and labour power and a gap between use value and exchange value, which I'll talk about again in terms of tomorrow, and explaining the surface from labour alone and, and having a, an argument that machinery produces no surplus whatsoever, all of which in energy terms has to be wrong. The reason we can produce so much physical output is because machines harness more energy than labour can. And I'll give you an equation on that basis shortly. So you saw the surplus is coming only from labour and argued that the machine had no productivity whatsoever. And that became the basis of the labour theory of value. Okay. Now, energy doesn't exist with the Marxists, so they have this idea of surplus being derived from being proportional to labour. Uh, Neoclassical, you've got substitutable factors of production, labour and capital. That's the classic Cobb-Douglas production function. 
and post-Keynesians have the idea of output being an either the minimum of either capital labour output or a labour productivity times labour production. Um, and Kumbel and Ayers have produced what they call the Linux production function, and that includes energy as an additional factor in exactly the same way as it's shown with the Cobb-Douglas. So rather than testing k to the alpha and l to the 1 minus alpha, you've got k to the alpha, l to the beta, e to the 1 minus alpha minus beta. Treating energy as equivalent in terms of form to labour and capital and it, um, but if you look up there, there's no energy input for the, the Marxists, there's no energy input for the neoclassicals, there's no energy input for the post-Keynesians, and there's energy here, but you could hypothetically set the energy input to zero and still get positive output. So none of them are complete. And what occurred to me this last year is the whole idea of talking about labour and capital without energy is absurd. Labour without energy is a corpse. Capital without energy is a sculpture. Okay? So what we should see them as is means to harness that energy and think of GDP as useful work, okay? which is a sensible definition of GDP as well. We're always fighting over how to define GDP. What does it really mean? At its fundamental level, it's doing useful work. And useful work you can quantify in terms of energy. Yeah? I, I, like, this is one, one of things I was like... Was what is um, what I was also thinking about, and like from that, um, and what I um, my <laughs> sorry, I have to, because um, the thing is that uh, people tend to if you can quantify it, then the, it exists. Yeah, this kind of yeah, stuff. that's that's true. Yeah, and this is like what I what I thought why they don't put it in the equation. So my my wish is like to have to. It is so difficult to. Quantify, okay, what does it cost the energy? How do I put it into the model to be able? No. It's but there are two firms which uses more energy. What does it like? What is the number yeah. to be able to? Yeah, it can be done. We're starting to do it. Oh, okay. 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 This is, okay. And that's, I've written the first paper on it already, and we're, we're, I'm working with a couple of econometricians and another mathematical economist okay. to start doing that. Hopefully, we'll have it done by the middle of next year. But what, or well, middle of uh, the end of this year? What you then say, output, which you see is useful work, is a function of capital, the energy harnessed by capital and the energy harnessed by labour in general. That's a generic way of, of stating it. Uh, and you can measure that in megajoules, whatever energy unit you like to express. So you fundamentally now see GDP as being measured in the amount of energy we're harnessing. And the rise in GDP over time is a rise in the amount of energy, GDP per capita, is a rise in the amount of energy we're all using. Now think about the amount of energy you all use to get here from wherever you've started from. That's more energy than was available to kings and queens 200 years ago in terms of the amount of time it took you to get to where you are now. No king or queen 200 years ago could harness that much energy to make to, to move that far that as quickly as you've managed to to get here. So the reason we're so much wealthier is the amount of energy that we're harnessing now that we didn't harness 200 years ago. And the amount of work depends upon, if you want to start trying to quantify it, how many workers you're talking about and how many machines. And I've got K in inverted commas because the whole idea of machines at the aggregate level is a non sequitur. Uh, and the flow of energy they're harnessing per unit of time. So how many megajoules per second or how many you know, calories per day in human terms are we able to harness? Uh, how much of that energy is available for useful work. So if you've just had breakfast, you may have consumed 500 calories. Part of that's needed to keep your body functioning. How much can you use to stay awake during my lecture? Okay, okay. That's, that's a ratio there. Plus you've also got to leave energy for reproduction because in that sense to have labour continuing, you've got to be able to reproduce, which means you've got to have clothing, you've got to have somewhere to live. So it's not just the... It's not just the energy, it's the reproduction of that it, it labour over time as well. So that ratio, if you try to work it out empirically, you might find it's about maybe 0.2, maybe 0.3, I'm not sure. How much energy do we take in versus how much do we need to reproduce, both ourselves and our forebears. And then also how efficiently we do that work. I've, I've thought about whether I have two terms for this or one, but I think two makes sense because the first is effectively the production and reproduction of the entity itself. And the second is how efficiently is that work done. So if I wanted to move, an, that the first thing might be a value of 0.2, let's say, 
The second would be comparing how much work I put in, would put in to move an object weighing one kilo, you know, 10 metres in one second from that corner of the room to that corner of the room versus being able to propel that weight of one kilo in one second across 10 metres on a frictionless surface and just start it off and stop it, how much energy would be involved in that? That's my, my final factor there. And the same thing applies for, for capital. So you can now break this equation down and say it's the number of, I won't use capital straight away because it's the one where K itself is hard to define, but with labour, it's going to be the number of workers times the energy per worker per time unit, which if we're working in calories per day, might be 4,000 calories per day, times the ratio of available energy to a total energy. Notice these two can cancel if you want to do that, times the efficiency ratio and the same thing effectively for capital. So let's then call this thing uh, the ratio of exergy. The term for, for useful available energy versus total energy is exergy. With all these, they've got exergy, energy, we all use the term energy. Who's heard of the term exergy before? Okay, that's one of the terms they've invented in this whole area. So exergy is available energy. So in your case, let's say, let's say the ratio is 0.5 then your total, your total calorie intake would be 4,000 calories if you're working as, you know, as labour in the fields. Uh, your available energy might be 2,000 calories, so your exergy ratio is 0.5. And then the efficiency would be another number again. So this is the energy, the number of units times the energy that can be processed times the exergy relationship times the efficiency. Now, of course, Energy for labour, what's the maximum amount of calories you reckon you could eat in one day? It's easy. Easy, yeah. Um, Bodybuilders eat like 7,000. 7, calories, okay. No, no, no. Per day. Per day. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, it's very lots of yeah, 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 you could eat the Google Phelps, how much calories he takes. Like, 1,000. How much? Twenty thousand? Yes. The top weightlifters. So Michael Phelps. Pardon? Michael Phelps. Twenty thousand. From Australia. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Swimmer. Oh, yeah. oh, the swimmer. Okay. Swimmer, yeah. Twenty thousand calories. Okay. Well, that's that'd be the human maximum. Yeah. Okay. But like, it's like uh, if you're the exception. Yeah. But that's. Can you imagine anybody consuming two million calories a day? No. Not going to happen. Yeah. What about a machine using two million calories a day? Well, naturally, uh, my favourite, I'm still trying to work out a, a, the, the actual data for a, 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 a watt steam engine. But a watt steam engine, would, I'm guessing, would have been using something like about 10 tonnes of coal per day. Okay. You know the Falcon 9 rocket, Elon Musk's most powerful rocket at the moment? Mm. Okay. He's got a new one called the Falcon Heavy, which is coming up. It's going to have its first launch in November. That's going to have three rockets attached together. But the Falcon itself uses nine tonnes of fuel per second. Now you think about the amount of energy, of course we're talking much more refined fuel than coal as well. So 12 tonnes of coal, let's say, per day versus 9 tonnes per second, that's where the major productivity increases come from, massive increase in the amount of energy we're using. And of course you can't do that with labour, but you can do it with capital. So this here you can really see is a constant. So the average person, there'd be nothing wrong with giving a value of 3,000 calories to that or 2,500 calories. And therefore, the available energy work they're going to be doing is going to be less than that. You know, maybe half of that is available, and maybe one they're working at maybe one half efficiency as well. But over here, there's still going to be a maximum that that level is going to be much less than one. There's good arguments that the exergy ratio for capital is less than the exergy ratio for humans because if you put two humans and enough food together, you'll get a third human. If you put two machines together, you'll never get a third machine. Okay? So there's more work in reproducing machinery than there is work in reproducing humans. So that ratio is probably lower for machinery, but this, the, the ratio is lower. But this number, so far, has no limit. Okay? We've gone from trivial amounts of energy per day when we first started inventing machines that harness the energy to enormous amounts now, and there's no reason why we can't keep on going further, dramatically further over and time. And also, like the small EL, it yeah. will, the efficiency for the labor, it will increase with the time. Like, if I'm used yeah. to carry this yeah. more time, so I yeah. will be better at it. Yeah, but there's also a limit. 
to that, but whereas a machinery you can keep on designing more and more ways to improve the efficiency. So if you look at the um, original electric energy, electric machines converted about 30%, now we're talking about Tesla cars apparently having a 95% conversion of the energy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, machinery is going to do better on the efficiency. Think about, like, the, again, I use a lot of Elon Musk examples. I'm, I'm a fan of, there's two people I'm a fan of on the planet. One's Roger Federer, the other's Elon Musk. <laughs> uh, but, but Musk's idea of the hypercube, hypertube, the idea of having a transportation system with almost in a vacuum at 1,000 kilometres an hour, minimum friction, and therefore extremely high efficiency of motion. And all you've got to do is get the thing moving, keep it going at a particular speed against very small resistance, and then evacuate a tube and then stop it at the other end versus hopping in a train, which has to continue you know, the train's forever using power to overcome the friction of both the air it's pushing against and the rails and so on. So the efficiency, that efficiency quotient for machinery, we can, we've definitely refined that over time. It's definitely risen. But it's got a maximum. It can't be greater than one. Okay. But the other thing which can go up indefinitely is the amount of energy that goes on. Now let's actually start putting this in, in terms of the neoclassical economists we recognise. So I've taken now saying output is a function of energy in constant returns to scale terms is capital, all the capital components raised to the alpha times labour to the one minus alpha. Let's work with it a bit. Uh, so, uh, one quick question. Uh, I'm totally lost, but it's okay. <laughs> I will find my way out. Okay. Maybe. But uh, regarding labour, uh, are we talking about the energy? Um, to my mind, the most energy that labor is producing today is related to man's um, intellectual power. No, we're talk talking physical calories here, because most of, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it, it, what we're doing in terms of our intellectual power ends up in how we design our machines. Ah, you put okay. it under yeah. machines. Well, it's really saying, if, if, like, the, the contribution Elon Musk is making in energy terms is no greater than the kind of contribution James Watt made in energy terms. Mm -hmm. They both would have been putting a few three or four thousand calories a day. But Musk has built on all the technology that's come before him. Uh, Watt was the, the very first technologist to make an you know, efficient steam engine. Mm -hmm. okay. So but his ideas were embodied in the machinery. If they weren't embodied in the machinery, they wouldn't matter. Okay. So ultimately that intelligence that we use turns up in the machinery we produce. That's how we embody it. So fundamentally the labour component I'm talking about here is unskilled labour. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. So I've just taken that, that term here and reworked it and there's our Cobb Douglas production function but there's all the stuff that's left out. Now that to me is the solo residual what's called the solo residual, which is all the stuff that complex production can't explain, you can't explain it because it's left it out. It's energy. This one's going to be a constant. This is labor's contribution. You pretty much treat that as a constant. But that's what's been rising over time. And the whole idea of machines itself is, a, is an abstraction. Uh, but there's our Cobb Douglas production function. There's the energy provide for unskilled labour, which is pretty much a constant. Um, so you may say 4,000 calories a day, just using 0.5, you might get a number like about 1,000 raised to whatever 1 minus alpha ends up being. Uh, and call that lambda, capital lambda, just to take it out of the equation. Um, and then this is the energy contribution of machinery. And the energy parameters there are the energy consumed per machine per day. That's risen dramatically, we know that. Uh, XK and EK are time varying, and there's every reason that XK can rise, e, EK would rise and fall over time. Because when we have very, very cheap energy, like back in the days of oil before OPEC, gas guzzlers, you know, the, that was the term we used to use for American cars. Then the price of oil increases by a factor of four and a factor of four again, energy efficiency becomes an argument. Then we forget about it when the oil price falls once more. So all these things would vary over time, but we don't have data on those. So the final formula looks like this. And compared to a Cobb Douglas production function, the similarities are quite strong. You can see that the solar residual, that's the solar residual. What they call A, I've identified now as the energy contribution for machinery. Uh, and if you look at the Kumalaire's form, which at least includes energy, 
Um, you can't do anything with that. If you try to put that in terms of energy per unit of, per, 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 per head, this is, this is uh, total GDP. If you want a GDP per head and you divide through by the number of people, then you're going to get an employment rate here times you, you can't you, you you end up with energy capital and labor per head you you can't refine it but if I divide through by the number of workers here then I get the capital labor ratio turning up here uh, times I think actually hang on I've actually made a mistake there I realized that no, I've got to work on that one a bit this is the one I really want to work on here is um, getting rid of the K times EK term there. We've got K, K which we don't know, K is an abstraction, times energy per machine which we don't know, also an abstraction. We do know the total amount of energy used by manufacturing. And so I can substitute, this is the Greek E, for the amount of energy used in the economy. And again, different countries have got more accurate statistics. Uh, but America has a reasonably good data on energy used by manufacturing and also energy used by the total society. So I can substitute that term in here and now have an energy, have a production function related entirely to the number of workers hired times the energy used in production times the efficiency with which that is used. And with that substituted equation there, I can put it in per capita terms. So if I divide through by the number of people, so I've got GDP per capita, then I'm dividing through by energy per capita as well. And I have L there as well. If we've got, that is N to the one minus alpha, and this is N to the alpha. So I've completely absorbed the terms in terms of the employment rate and the energy per capita. So I've now got an expression that I can fit to data. There's GDP per capita is gonna be this constant based, which is related to the energy input of the unskilled labour, times the employment rate to the one minus alpha, times energy per head to the alpha, times the sufficiency component where we don't actually have the data. And we know that GDP per head has got a cyclical trend to it. We know that energy per head has a trend to it. We know that employment has got a cycle to it. So we can break these things down into their various components. And we have data for GDP per head, data for the employment rate and data for energy per head, but we don't have data for the time varying efficiency, unfortunately. So this is the data, and I got a bit, of, I got a bit scared when I saw this data, because I thought, holy shit, it's gonna be hard to fit my equation to this data. That's GDP per capita, which has been rising. You notice it's gone pretty flat uh, since the financial crisis, but from 1965 uh, all the way through, growing quite constantly. This is the employment rate. Now this peaked in 2000 for America and all the stuff about the economy having recovered. There's the, um, the employment rate before the financial crisis. That's the, um, that's the employment rate at the depth of the financial crisis. That's the employment rate now. It has not recovered. And this is data which is, this is OECD data, mm -hmm. okay? It's not data from some weird website somewhere. And this is the stuff the Americans are still ignoring and claiming they're back to full employment. So that's got, a, to me, a strong political component to it as well. But one thing that really surprised me is this one, energy per capita in America. And that peaked back in 1979, plunged seriously across the uh, OPEC uh, crises, rose a bit, reached another peak back in 2000, and that's been plunging ever since. Now a lot of this, um, that's you know, that that break in this that trend. If you actually look at this trend here for rising energy per capita, that goes back 200 years. There's data going back to 1700 for America, showing that rising very very consistently over that time period from much more trivial levels. That's the number of energy in, 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 in kilograms of oil equivalent per year. So the average American back in 1965 was consuming about 6,500 kilos of oil per year. And you think about the amount of energy in 6,500 kilos of oil, that's a fair bit of energy. Maximum reach was about 8,500, then it's fallen since then. When I saw that, I thought, I'm gonna have a hard time fitting my equation to data here. Anyway, I'll show you in a moment. 
So you had this huge increase in the oil price over those two time periods. Then you had a fall in the oil price, which led to a, an increasing uh, increase in output as well. We also know that the working class was doing its best back at this point. So there's some elements of this about, you know, the, the energy usage is also telling us something about real incomes, because that's fallen for workers overall. Uh, but perhaps over this period as well, we've had rising efficiency and rising energy capability. We've actually got to the halfway mark, haven't we? One and a half, we'll get to the break. Um, but I'll, I'll quickly show you the results of fitting this to the data that we can stop at this point. So in per capita forms, this is my equation. The Cobb-Douglas in per capita forms looks like this. So they only really differ in terms of the energy versus the capital components and the energy exergy stuff that I can't actually know. So if you took it in terms of looking at a rate of change, then you take a you, you know, differential of logs, you get that output for my equation. I've got to set those to zero because there's no data on them. There's the Cobb-Douglas production function. And so the odds are stacked against my equation because of that change in the exergy and energy efficiency ratios, which we don't know. And capital data itself is derived directly from GDP right now. So in that sense, it's self-determined. So it's a fallacy. I've mentioned that to you beforehand. I haven't shown you the data, but I, I can give you slides on that front. So here's the capital data for the UK capital per head. That doesn't show the same decline in energy. So you might think it's got a better chance of fitting the data, which is what I was worried about. So you only differ by these two terms. And they're actually correlated with each other, capital per head and energy per head in terms of rates of change. There is a correlation between the two. But Cobb-Douglas production function, its correlation with the data is 0.73, mine correlation 0.81. So, okay, it's pretty clear. We're doing much more elaborate work. Well, I'm not a statistician, so I'm working with a Portuguese statistician to do uh, much more work than this. But it's already superior to the Cobb-Douglas, despite absent data. And they both, funnily enough, get the same High cor the highest correlation was alpha is equal to 0.75. Now, in the Cobb-Douglas days, that was taken as a justification for the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. There's no such component here because the marginal productivity of labour here is 1,000 calories a day. Okay? In other words, the wage is far greater than the marginal product of labour. And ditto for the machinery, ditto for capital. Okay? It's not their marginal product at all. It's this political dispute over the distribution of income. Let's go have some coffee. Yeah, thank you.